Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos. And today I'm near this wonderful Victorian era pavilion in Riverside Park in South Baltimore. And we're going to talk about the park today. And I am thrilled that I'm going to be joined by a young man named Abe Stolback. Abe is just beginning his freshman year at Baltimore City College. For those of you who did not grow up in Baltimore, that's a high school. And Abe is particularly well suited to join me. He lives just around the corner from this park and uses it all the time and last spring his competition in the national history day competition scored in the very very top tier not top tier locally or statewide but nationally um, i will admit that when i learned that i started bragging to all my friends that we had a top tier historian uh, coming out of here in baltimore um, and to boot abe uh, a year ago was part of a seventh grade class that won one of our micro grants and used it to rent a school school bus to visit local history museums. So it's going to be pretty neat to hear from Abe. Before I turn it over to him, let me just say a word or two about how we got a park here. And I'm going to start with the War of 1812. Many of us know the role that Fort McHenry played in saving Baltimore from the British, but a lesser known story happened right here. The British, as they were trying to muscle their way past the fort, they also put a thousand soldiers on barges and headed them towards the shores of the Patapsco on the south side of the fort to try to land and then invade kind of by the back door. We had anticipated that and built a fort here called Fort Lookout and along with Forts Babcock and Fort uh, uh, Covington, excuse me, uh, the three forts here repelled that secondary invasion and helped uh, keep Baltimore from falling into the British hands. We commemorated that. It took us a little while. Uh, in 1862, we bought three acres and uh, right here and called it Battery Square, commemorating the efforts that went on here. About a decade later, we went bigger and we bought 14 more acres and renamed the park Riverside Park for its views of the Patapsco River. Um, incidentally, that is not the last time that it changed names. In 1976, if you read the sign, you'll see uh, that it is Leon Riverside Park. And Leon is Dominic Leon, a longtime city council member from here in South Baltimore, who tragically was killed inside City Hall when a deranged gunman entered, uh, hoping to find William Donald Schaefer, the mayor. He did not find Schaefer, but unfortunately he found Leon in 1976. Uh, we named this park in his honor. All right, back to 1870s. Uh, if you owned a park and it was the 1870s, you were into passive uses. And the city here built footpaths for strollers. We had water fountains installed for thirsty strollers. Um, we even built a marble fountain with goldfish in it for the amusement of strollers. And then behind me, we built a wonderful pavilion that's still here uh, for, to give strollers shade. But about 1900, passive uses gave way to active uses, especially in the lower part of the park. We installed a basketball court and tennis courts, an outdoor gymnasium, and out went the goldfish fountain and in went a swimming pool that immediately attracted hundreds of kids each day in the summer, and today still attracts hundreds of kids uh, in the summer days. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Abe. Abe, we are all yours. Hi, my name is Abe Solbeck, and I'm a freshman at Baltimore City College. And I'm here today to tell you about the more active uses of the park um, starting in the early 1900s and coming into today. Um, so after the Victorian era, people uh, were a lot more interested in using their parks and recreation spaces for not just strolling or horseback riding, but they were really interested in getting to use them for their full benefit. A pool was constructed. There was a whole playground on the southern end of the park. Um, and there were many ball fields. Park members also hosted activities at the park. Uh, one example is a cooking class um, for young boys and 12 signed up. And uh, an interesting tidbit from the newspaper article is that although they weren't required to, they actually ended up cleaning up after themselves. There was a hothouse, which back in the day, people were very interested in exotic plants. And the hothouse was a perfect way to get at that interest and to help encourage that pastime. Um, so a hothouse was basically a big greenhouse. It was very pretty. Um, there's one in Druid Hill Park. It's a big glass greenhouse with uh, wrought iron uh, framing and like a skeleton. But inside there were tropical plants and uh, people found these to be really interesting. After all, tropical plants can't survive regularly in the native climate of Baltimore. Um, so it was a way for people to kind of feel as if they were in another place. Um, and the hothouse also hosted activities. Uh, for example, there was a baby health contest to find out who had the healthiest baby. And 
uh, a newspaper article from the time is very specific about uh, how the babies were not eager participants uh, in the competition. As I mentioned before, uh, there was also a pool, and um, as was common in Baltimore and other cities back during back in the day, uh, the pool was segregated, unfortunately. However, during the uh, civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, um, there was a desegregation effort at the pool, and it was notably attended by the late Representative Elijah Cummings when he was still young. And uh, there was a violent resistance, but ultimately um, desegregation of the pool and other park facilities was successful. And today, people use the park for all sorts of activities. Uh, there's basketball courts, there's a baseball field, there's even a pickleball court um, built two or three years ago. And people love to walk their dogs, myself included. Come on down and join us at the park uh, to spend your day.